join Forum IS Academy, trusted by hundreds of toppers, including IS Rank 1 Shruti Sharma. Hello and welcome to Forum IAS. Today is 4th June 2023 and these are all the articles that we are going to see today. The first article is about the train derailments. In 2022, the Office of Comptroller and Auditor General of India, they came out with a report on derailments in Indian Railways. And in that particular report, there were some suggestions given, there were some observations that were made, which is relevant in the context of the accident that took place in Balasore. So, this particular report which came out in 2022, it says that an accident investigation, so an accident takes place on T plus 0th day, and from there, within a particular timeline, the whole of the investigation must be completed. That is one of the suggestions made by this report. One more observation that the report makes is that, uh, basically, to inspect the tracks, we have track recording cars and track machines. These are all meant for track maintenance and for error checking. The CAG report found out that 30 to 100 percent of inspections there are shortfalls. So, this is one of the major reasons why we are not able to prevent the accidents. If these precautionary measures were taken in letter and spirit, the amount of accidents, the extent of accidents will also be low. And uh, the report quotes that there are major factors that are responsible for accidents the first thing is from the engineering department next reason is maintenance of track which can straight away be linked to this point wherein there is idling of track machines and the shortfalls in the reportage of track recording cars it can be directly linked here and next reason for train accidents is deviation of track parameters beyond permissible limits again this can be linked to the point stated here that there should be proper track maintenance instead there were shortfalls ranging from 30 to 100 percent in inspections by track recording cars now understand the amount of importance that needs to be given to track maintenance Major accidents took place because of this region, albeit they are being classified under different heads. But this is not so important for the exam point of view. The train accidents, what are all the precautionary measures to be taken, history of railways, all those were discussed in the previous discussions of our Hindu daily series. Now we need to look into the office of CAG. We have to have clarity about it so that we are well equipped to attend MCQs and we are also equipped to provide data in our mains examination. Now let us go to the next slide. So the powers of CAG, how the appointment is made, these things start from article 148. This article talks about appointment of Comptroller and Auditor General of India. The appointment is made by the President. The manner of removal of CAG is similar to that of a Judge of Supreme Court. So, the salary, service conditions, pensions, age of retirement, all these things are determined by the Parliament. And even if the Parliament determines these things, during the tenure of a CAG, the salary service conditions, they cannot be varied to his disadvantage. This is meant as a check on the power of legislature. So, the legislature is not able to force the CAG to act a certain way by doing pay cuts or any cuts in his service conditions. And CAG is generally not eligible for reappointment, which is a very important fact. It might be asked in exam also. And whatever is the expenses related to the office of CAG, they are 
charged on the consolidated fund of india which means this expenses are not voted upon what is the tenure of cag it is 6 years or 65 years of age whichever is earlier and cag has some special powers cag and his staff they can inspect any office of organizations which are subject to his audit say for example regulatory bodies like sebi are even subject to cag audit so cag can go to their office and request any document they can have rights over the premises of the office as well that is given here access to books papers documents etc what are the duties and powers of cag so to perform such duties and exercise such powers in relation to the accounts of the union of india and states and of any other bodies or authority as may be prescribed by any law made by the parliament which means there is a single cag for both union as well as states so the cag has rights over state accounts as well form of accounts of the union of india and states so the cag has the power to prescribe with the approval of the president the form in which the account of the union and the states are to be kept a common confusion with respect to the portion cag is that whether it is applicable for states also yes it is very much applicable to states more so even the books the maintenance of the accounts of states as well as union they are prescribed the method in which the books are maintained is prescribed by the cag next slide what is the duty of cag what is expected of cag what is the rationale behind institution of an office called cag to ascertain whether money shown in the accounts as having been dispersed was legally available for are applicable to the service or the purpose to which they have been applied or charged and whether the expenditure conforms to the authority that governs it so it is a very lengthy statement what it necessarily means is that any expense that is made out of the accounts that is consolidated fund of india the cag will inspect whether these expenses are legally made it's not arbitrary simple words the cag will look into this thing whether the expenses are made in a proper way whether they are made legally available okay and they are used for the same purpose for which they were withdrawn for okay and the expenses should not be arbitrary that means so if you have to withdraw money from consolidated fund of india it can be withdrawn only by the authority of parliament that is why we are saying that the money can be withdrawn legally the executive themselves the government of the day they cannot operate the consolidated fund of india without legislative approval okay and whatever reason the executive they are stating in the law the amount that is withdrawn should be made available for that only say for example 100 crores is there okay and this is withdrawn for uh, let us say sugamya bharat abhiyan so this is for divyangjan so it is made available for them so the reason stated is this and the cab will check whether the same money is being made available for this only or is it used to buy vehicles for another government department you know it is not an authorized expenditure so in simple terms the cag will see whether the money is withdrawn from the consolidated fund of india in a legal way and whether the withdrawn money is also spent for the purpose for which it was withdrawn this is checked by the cag and this cag they can also perform propriety audit that is wisdom faithfulness and economy of government expenditure if the government is saying they are withdrawing 100 crore for this purpose is it commensurate to that scheme whether the scheme needs this much allocation or can it be done with lesser allocation also that is wisdom faithfulness and economy of expenses but 
this propriety audit it is not a obligatory audit it is not obligatory it is only discretionary legal audit regulatory audit they are obligatory but propriety audit is discretionary okay whether it is legally withdrawn whether it is made available for the same purpose this audit is mandatory whether 100 crore is the needed expense whether it can be lessened or not that is a proprietary audit and that proprietary audit is discretionary in nature i hope you have got the clarity with respect to cag next article talks about government banning 14 combination drugs after panel flags risks questions efficacy so this combination drugs what is it we have to know this is very unique to india okay they are called as fixed dose combinations what is fixed dose combination combination products also known as fixed dose drug combinations they are combinations of two or more active drugs in a single dosage form say for example paracetamol is there this is for fever like symptoms and it is combined with say a painkiller like diclofenac so this is known as combination drug instead of giving two medicines they are combined into one single drug that is what it is said two or more active drugs in a single dosage form this is just for example purpose this might not be an exact combination drug just for a disclaimer so basically some of these fixed dose combinations have been banned by the government why because they lack therapeutic relevance according to cidesco that is the central drug standard control organization like how us has fda india has cdsco it is india's regulatory body so the cidesco they have recommended the banning of certain fixed dose combinations to the government so here also they have given fdcs refer to products containing one or more active ingredients used for particular indications simply speaking it is a combination drug so basically why these combination drugs were banned because there is no therapeutic justification and they may also involve risk to human beings see if two or more drugs are combined what happens is over the counter sales is huge in india right so that is the reason why these fixed drug combinations are being banned because over the counter sales is huge like we can go to the medical shop right now and we can get the drugs we want that is not the case in western countries so what happens is there is a lot of self medication okay and if there is self medication and these fdcs are also available what happens is many a times it leads to overdose and if it is in overdose it poses risk to the health of human beings it might also sometimes cause anti microbial resistance amr okay so fixed drug combinations they are being banned for this reason because of the nature of health system in india this is leading to harmful effects in human beings so that is why they are being banned and one more point of relevance in this article is the cdsco what is this body so it is a central drug authority which discharges the functions assigned to the central government under the drugs and cosmetics act so basically this authority they are administering the drugs and cosmetics act what are the major functions of cdsco firstly regulatory control over the import of drugs approval of new drugs as well as clinical trials meetings of drugs consultative committee that is also conducted by cdsco drugs technical advisory board so these meetings are convened and they are conducted by the cdsco 
in this particular decision also drugs technical advisory board they had a significant role and that is facilitated by the cdsco approval of certain licenses as a central license approving authority so these are all the powers and functions of cdsco and now we are seeing that they are, they can even recommend discontinuing certain drugs from the market so it is a very comprehensive and powerful body next article is about mgnregs so what the government is saying is for the past 2 3 years there have been complaints that these mgnregs workers they are not getting salary on time and one of the reasons that has been found out was that there is a changing nature of account number of these worker and because of this there is delay in disbursement of wages so government is saying if the mgnregs beneficiary their aadhar number is ceded so what happens regardless of the account number change by virtue of aadhar number the money can be channeled into their account so this particular suggestion is made by the rural development ministry and it has asked the states to do the necessary things in order to cede aadhar number for ngnregs beneficiaries okay so that is the summary of this article now we have to see about the ngnregs act itself okay so it is the largest work guarantee program in the world and it was launched in 2005 and it is under the ministry of rural development so this scheme or this act it is legally made available so we take it as an act so basically the scheme is to grant 100 days of employment in every financial year to adult members of any rural household they need not be below poverty line above poverty line caste nothing matters any rural household any adult member who are willing to do public work related unskilled manual work the things that you need to remember are that it is guaranteed 100 days of employment in every financial year any adult member and it is related to unskilled manual work so because the act has come it has become a legal right to work if it was a scheme then the person the aggrieved person cannot claim it that i need to be given work because it has been made an act there is a legal right to work why because we are addressing chronic poverty here chronic poverty means prolonged poverty so at least they should get 100 days of employment so that they are not suffering from chronic poverty that is why we have come up with a rights based framework and one more thing is at least one third of beneficiaries have to be women that is 33% right 33% of the beneficiaries have to be women and the wages that are paid in terms of this unskilled manual work it is according to the minimum wages act and this scheme is a demand driven scheme that means within 15 days of demanding work they have to be given work otherwise an unemployment allowance at least must be given okay and in this act it is mandated that gram sabhas they would recommend the works that are to be undertaken so we are solving twin problems one is rural unemployment and another one is lack of rural infrastructure so both these problems are countered when we say that the gram sabha has to recommend the works and at least 50% of the works should be executed by them this also empowers grassroots level democratic institutions so narega is not just about the executives implementing it because even the gram sabhas they have the mandate to complete at least 50% of the works next why is india rethinking its anemia policy this is a very interesting article and you will 
learn some interesting things by virtue of it let us jump into the article so national family health survey 6th edition so this will be held in july of this year so the last edition of national family health survey it took place in 2019 to 2021 and before that nfhs 4 it took place in 2015 to 2016 so we can see that it happens within a gap of 5 years roughly 4 to 5 years all right so basically in the upcoming nfhs the anemia related questions are going to be dropped why that we are going to understand so basically why there needs to be a policy redirection when we are going to deal with anemia because it has been found out that anemia burden in india is increasing that is 57% of women in the age group of 15 to 49 that is the reproducible age group and 67% of children between 6 months and 59 months they are anemic when we compare it to the previous edition previous edition only 53% of women and 58.6% of children were anemic but in the latest edition it has increased which shows that anemia burden has increased in india so we need to rethink despite doing many government schemes despite paying attention to it if the schemes are not working then the approach has be has to be rethought so what they are going to do is they are going to drop anemia related questions from nfhs 6 and they are going to adopt a different approach what approach we will see in the next slide firstly we have to understand what is anemia what is anemia when the number of red blood cells or the hemoglobin concentration within the red blood cells are lower than normal so hemoglobin only carries oxygen to various parts of the body if there is very few hemoglobin then how effective will be the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood right if there is anemia hemoglobin is less and conversely it decreases the capacity of the blood to carry oxygen to the body tissues so if the body parts are not getting enough oxygen they will be performing under their optimum level so it will lead to symptoms such as fatigue weakness dizziness shortness of breath etc so this is the cause of anemia and mainly iron deficiency leads to anemia iron deficiency all right so what we are going to do is we are going to drop the questions on anemia from nfhs 6 and instead we are going to shift it to the new diet and biomarker survey so first edition is going to be held and last year only this particular survey was conceptualized what this survey will do is that it will map the diet nutrition and health status in the rural as well as urban population so this particular survey is more diet focused whereas nfhs is more focused on the demographic data so we are more streamlining how we are going to track anemia so what prompted this particular change the mainly the prompt for this change is due to methodology what in methodology so basically when we go to measure hemoglobin in the blood generally the finger is pricked and blood oozes out from that finger prick from there the hemoglobin level is estimated but what they are saying that this particular approach it can dilute the blood and it will give a falsely lower value instead of going for finger pricking if we are going to take the sample from intravenous that is from the veins if the blood is collected and then the hemoglobin content is checked that will give a more accurate reading so we are shifting the approach of measurement of hemoglobin and that it will change 
the amount of anemic population also because the previous method it was giving false readings okay so that is the reason it is being shifted now we are going into dabs that is diet and biomarker survey here it is given so will this particular diet and biomarker survey help how because it is a national level dietary survey it will define food and nutrient adequacy so it will collect individual dietary intake data of different age groups from all states and uts across the country and it will also provide so firstly it will collect data about the diet and after that the survey will provide nutrient composition so this particular dabs is more focused on food how healthy food is consumed by majority of indians but nfhs is much more broader and in this process we are missing on the nitty gritties that is why a separate survey has been instituted in the form of dabs let us see how it works out in the long run next is why there is a focus on anemia because it is useful to monitor the progress of reproductive health if the pregnant mothers are anemic then it might lead to severe blood loss and as well as even maternal mortality so if we are going to combat anemia we are also endeavoring to reduce the mmr so if there is iron deficiency and anemia we said already that it will lead to fatigue and tiredness so this will reduce the work capacity of individual and the entire population so overall it is bad for economy as well as national development in order to improve our human capital also we must properly track anemia and we have to come up with measures to combat this anemia that is why we are changing our approach okay the next article it says that opec plus begins meetings that may seal more output cuts opec is the organization of the petroleum exporting countries we'll see who are all the members of opec opec plus in the next slide so what they are planning is that they are going for supply cuts so basically this opec plus this group it constitutes for about 40% of global crude so whatever policy they are taking it will affect the global economy so opec meeting is going on opec plus discussions are going on so it is more probable that up to 1 million barrels per day supply cut will happen that is being stated okay so this is happening opec is basically it consists of the arab countries some african countries and russia so generally the west they accuse the opec of siding with russia so basically opec opec plus is a russia led group generally west is antagonized of this group nevertheless they hold 40% of global production capacity so they have a voice in the global arena now we will see who are all the members so the members that are in dark blue they are the opec members and we have opec plus member in opec plus category only russia is there mexico is there right so these are all the other countries now we will see specifically the opec members we have arab countries like iran qatar uae saudi arabia kuwait iraq then we have in the mena region north africa region we have algeria libya and another oil producing country is nigeria we have gabon republic of congo angola equatorial guinea venezuela ecuador they are all members of opec then we have opec plus that is russia we have mexico and we also have Malaysia Malaysia is also a member of OPEC plus these are all the major countries of OPEC plus okay so they constitute almost 40% of crude oil production okay so that's it for today's discussion we will see some previous year questions 
So this is from 2018 prelims. So it says that momentum for change, climate neutral now, is an initiative launched by A. IPCC, B. UNEP Secretariat, C. UNFCCC Secretariat, D. WMO, that is the World Meteorological Organization. So this is a very factual question. Answer is C. UNFCCC Secretariat. Next question. Which one of the following statements correctly describes the meaning of legal tender money? A. The money which is tendered in courts of law to defray the fee of legal cases. So, legal tender has nothing to do with courts. So, this option is wrong. The money which a creditor is under compulsion to accept in settlement of his claims. We will hold with this. The bank money in the form of check, draft, bills of exchange. But it is not legal tender. Okay. These are all fiat money but it is not legal tender. Metallic money in circulation. Not just metallic money. Even paper currency can be legal tender. So answer is B. It says that money which creditor is under compulsion to accept in settlement of his claims. Which means if you go to a shop and if you buy something worth rupees 100 and you are giving a 100 rupee note, it is a legal tender. So if you are giving 100 rupee note, the shopkeeper cannot refuse that. He cannot say that you have to pay via online. I won't take 100 rupee note. Give me 10 tens. He cannot refuse. That is legal tender. There is no right to refuse by the counterparty. That is what it means when we say legal tender. Last question. After the Santal uprising subsided, what was or where the measure or measures taken by the colonial government? The territories called Santal Parganas were created. It became illegal for a Santal to transfer land to a non-Santal. So we know that Santal rebellion it took place in modern day West Bengal. Right. So it is more about the uprising of Santal against the outsiders. So both these options are true. So answer is C both 1 and 2. That's it for today's discussion. Follow us on all these social media platforms. This is Indumati signing off. Thank you and all the best.